Thank you, Mark, and good morning. We are continuing our studies in 2 Timothy, and as you can tell, we're coming to the end of it. We will finish, Lord willing, next week. But this morning, it is 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 9 through 15. Follow along with me, beginning with verse 9. Paul writes, Make every effort to come to me soon. For Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Pick up Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for service. But Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak which I left at Troas with Carpus and the books, especially the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Be on guard against him yourself, for he vigorously opposed our teaching. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and our time of studying it together. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. One of the greatest blessings in life is the blessing of friendship. If a person has a few good friends, that person is rich and rich indeed. Proverbs prove the truth of that. Solomon wrote that a friend loves at all times and sticks closer than a brother. Not many people do that. Loyalty is rare. So true friends are valuable, better than gold. And Christ promised that those who follow him will never lack them. If we choose him over our family or friends, it will not go unnoticed. He promised that we will receive a hundred times as much in this life and in the next. In Christ we have friends, the best friends. We will also have enemies. Paul had both. He speaks of them in these closing verses of the last chapter of the last letter that he wrote. He longed to see his good friend Timothy. Paul's death was imminent. He faced it bravely. He was confident, but not stoical. He wasn't indifferent to his situation. It was naturally a difficult time for the apostle. And before he departed, he wanted to see the young man that he spoke of as his spiritual child, his beloved son, as he put it earlier in chapter 1. And so in verse 9, he writes, Make every effort to come to me soon. Time was short. Paul was already being poured out as a drink offering, and he wanted to spend his last days with Timothy. And no doubt there were practical reasons for this. The church was in a crisis. There was a lot of uh, instruction the apostle needed to give to Timothy and, and couldn't communicate that fully in a letter. He needed to speak to him further about matters of truth and strategy. But still, there were personal reasons. Paul was a mighty man of God, a spiritual lion. But he's also a man of strong affections. He had great love for all of his friends and the saints. And at the beginning of the letter, he wrote of how he prayed for Timothy night and day and longed to see him. And he remembered how Timothy had wept when he was arrested and taken away. He knew that Timothy longed to see him. And so he tells him that he needed to come quickly if he were to ever see him again in this life. The trip to Rome from Ephesus would be a long one, the journey uh, that would take at least four months over land and sea and 
Time was short. What made the situation all the more urgent for Paul is that Paul had been abandoned. Come to me soon, he said, for Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me. Those were painful words for the Apostle Paul. I suspect they were shocking words to Timothy, who would have been a good friend of Demas. Demas had been a close friend of the Apostle Paul. He'd been a faithful colleague in his ministry. He mentioned Demas in two of his letters in Philemon 24. Paul calls him a fellow worker along with Mark and Luke. He was part of Paul's inner circle. In Colossians 4, verse 14, both Demas and Luke sent their greetings to the church. Other than this, we know little about Demas. But from this, we can gather that Demas was a man of substance, uh, a man who had demonstrated his gifts and abilities in the ministry. Paul would never have chosen him as a companion in this most important service of the gospel if he had not been that, if he had not been a man of, of substance. Paul was very careful about such things. Demas must have been a man of sound doctrine and, and proven experience. Paul had seen great potential in him. He'd seen faithfulness in him. He had been with Paul in difficult circumstances. But here he failed him. This Roman imprisonment was more difficult than the first one. In that first one, Paul was under house arrest awaiting trial. But now he was a condemned man who, according to tradition, was kept in the Mamertine prison. It's a dark, cold hole in the ground. If you've been to Rome, you can visit that. You can see it and you know exactly what I mean. So it was all too difficult for Demas, and he left Paul, left him at a time when Paul needed him, and went back to his home in Thessalonica, because, Paul said, he loved this present world. Opinions differ on the nature of his departure. Some considered a apostasy, that is, deserting Paul in doing that, Demas left the faith. He denied Christ and the gospel. That's what apostasy is. It is deliberately rejecting the faith and turning irrevocably from Christ. Such people are the rocky soil of Christ's parable in Matthew 13 where the seed never takes root and under the hot sun it withers away. Judas Iscariot was an apostate. He never truly followed Christ, not, not as a believer. In fact, Jesus identified him as a devil in John chapter 6 and verse 70. He was never a true believer because a true believer can never commit apostasy. We're born again. We're people of a new nature and people who are sealed with the Holy Spirit. God's elect persevere in the faith. But that doesn't mean they don't fall into terrible sin that we don't grieve the Holy Spirit, that we can't continue in that condition for a protracted period of time and, and lose the joy of salvation, lose the assurance of salvation, and drift. God's people do that. Peter did that. The Westminster Confession of Faith lists all of these as conditions that genuine believers fall into. But the confession states... They are never utterly destitute of that seed of God and life of faith, that love of the brethren, that sincerity of heart and conscience of duty. And in time, by the operation of the Holy Spirit, by the grace of God, they're brought back, their assurance is revived, and they can become active again in the faith. That, that happened to Peter, a great example of that. Christ warned him of his sin. He warned him of what was going to happen. And so he should have been, uh, he was being forewarned, ready for that, and, and should have been in prayer about it, but it wasn't. He was confident in himself, self-assured, 
and he failed. But what Jesus told him when he gave him that warning was, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. Now that was the reason Peter revived and persevered. It's, it's the only reason that any one of us perseveres. Christ prays for us and the Holy Spirit keeps us continuing in faith. The, the perseverance of the saints, as you've often heard it said, is really the perseverance of God with the saints or the preservation of the saints. Well, was Demas like that? Was he like Peter or was he like Judas? No, the text doesn't say. Paul called him a fellow worker and that is inspired scripture. Paul was directed by the Holy Spirit when he wrote that. And he didn't withdraw that description here. He didn't call him a heretic, didn't say he uh, was an apostate. Calvin wrote that his behavior was disgraceful. But, he said, we are not to suppose that he completely denied Christ and gave himself over again to ungodliness or the allurements of the world, but only that he cared more for his own convenience and safety than for the life of Paul. In, in, in Rome with Paul, Demas's life was at risk. He was exposed to ridicule. He was exposed to sickness. He was exposed to great difficulty. So, wrote Calvin, he decided to look to his own interests. Paul doesn't say that he denied Christ. He says he loved this world. I'm not sure that any one of us can escape altogether that description. All of us have moments of weakness and failure when we're put to the test. The world tempts us, tempts us with all kinds of things, on all kinds of ways. It tempts us with the allure of comfort. It tempts us with the allure of money, tempts us with, as I said, all kinds of things. And it has an appeal for lots of reasons and lots of ways it makes these appeals to us. And it did that to Demas, and at some point he was drawn away. He was captured by the world. Calvin was probably right when he called him one of the most outstanding of Paul's companions. But as outstanding as he may have been, the pull of the world was too strong. So Demas really serves as a warning to all of us, a warning to believers, genuine believers. The flesh is weak. The world is strong. We need to be aware of that and careful to run the race well. And how do we do that? Well, we do it the way the author of Hebrews told us to do it. Fixing your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. That's how you live life, because life is a race constantly. And you can only live it faithfully by keeping your eyes on the Savior. I would expand that. I don't think I'm violating what the author of Hebrews wrote. The triune God. But we, we understand the triune God through the second person of the Trinity who revealed God to us and all of the grace and the love that is expressed in Him. Focus on Him. That's how we run the race well. And that means also that we have to count the cost. The Lord doesn't promise us an easy life, not in this world. So don't expect it. Brace yourself for trials if you're going to follow Christ and be faithful to Him. Later in, in verse 20, Paul mentions Trophimus, who didn't leave Paul, who in fact became so sick serving Paul in the ministry of the gospel that Paul had to leave him in Miletus for his own good. In contrast to Demas, Trophimus had courage. He had spiritual stamina. Demas lacked it to Paul's great disappointment. And no doubt in the end to the even greater disappointment of Demas himself. He might have been remembered as a great soul winner. As another Timothy or Titus, he would have been a, a person that we refer to as a model for the way we should live. And instead he's now known as 
one that we shouldn't follow. He's known as a deserter. He's known as a man who loved this present world. Well, the world is a great cheat. It doesn't deliver and doesn't last. It is passing away, as Demas learned probably sooner than later. He was given a great opportunity in life, a great opportunity. Few men in all of history had that opportunity, and he lost it. The departure of Demas reminded Paul of others who had left, not out of worldliness or disloyalty, but out of duty. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Galatia is in Asia Minor, in modern Turkey, and Dalmatia was on the eastern coast of the Adriatic Sea. It's modern Croatia. Titus may have gone there on his return from Crete, where Paul had sent him, and to which the book of Titus was written when he was there in Crete, giving him instruction. So he's returned now. He's evidently returned. He has returned to Dalmatia. But Paul's companions in Rome were gone. They were gone either on business or, as with Demas, from desertion. So he was feeling increasingly isolated in his last days, and he longed for Timothy's company. That wasn't a weakness on Paul's part. That, that's natural. That's normal. Paul was a man, and it, 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 we were not made to live alone in this world. We were made for companionship, and, and Paul naturally longed for that companionship. He naturally longed to see his friends. We need friends. God knows that. And in his mercy, he had left Paul with one. He was not all alone in Rome. Luke was still there. Luke is with me, he writes in verse 11. But only Luke. Luke was loyal. In Colossians 4, verse 14, Paul called him the beloved physician. He remained with Paul in the most difficult times. He was faithful to the apostle to the end. Luke was an outstanding man. He was uh, uh, a brilliant man, a man of letters, a man of science. He was a doctor, he was a physician, and he was a historian, a genuine historian who wrote the book of the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, and you see at the beginning of both of those that he approached the subject as an historian. He did his research, he looked at documents, he was truly a, 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 a scholar who seemed to have joined Paul on the second missionary journey up in Troas. That's what's suggested from the pronouns that are used in the the descriptions of the journey, beginning in Acts 16, verse 10. He traveled with Paul. He was with him during his imprisonments. He sailed with him in the storm in Acts 27, was shipwrecked with him on the Isle of Malta, and arrived with him in the capital. And so we came to Rome, he wrote. He was with Paul through many of his great trials. He was with him in his last imprisonment, perhaps attending to his ailments, treating his thorn in the flesh, and and being a good friend who sticks closer than a brother. It was a dark time for Paul. All in Asia had turned away from him. Loyal fellow workers were absent. But God gave him Luke, a physician and a friend. And you can see the wisdom of God's providence in that. If there's going to be one that stays with Paul, then it's the one who can treat his physical needs, his disabilities, and also care for him spiritually and be a good companion. And so, in his providence, God gave him Luke. God knows our needs, and he provides for us wisely and well. So we should trust him. Jonathan Edwards learned that. He had an experience very similar to Paul's, After many years of faithful service in the church in Northampton, prominent families conspired to have him dismissed. 
He left Northampton and went to the frontier of western Massachusetts as a missionary to the Indians. It was a period of isolation in which he was without many of his former friends. But God raised up new friends in unexpected places. People in Scotland whom he'd never met but who valued his writings began to correspond with him and they even provided for him financially. Edwards wrote, How true in this instance does it appear to be that God is an all-sufficient and faithful God and that His promise never fails, that we need no fear to trust Him in the way of obedience. Well, we need not fear to trust Him in the way of obedience because God is always faithful, always. And those who are put in that position, like Paul or like Edwards, experience that faithfulness when they trust the Lord and obey Him. Men may abandon us at a time of need, but the Lord promised that we would have friends. He will provide. He did for Paul. Luke was with him. But he also wanted Timothy to come quickly and not come alone. He asked him to bring Mark also. Pick up Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for service. Now that's a very interesting statement, and a very encouraging one. If Demas warns us of how weak we are, and how susceptible we are to the world's influence, then Mark reminds us uh, how gracious God is to restore us when we fall. Mark had been blessed with the privilege of growing up in what we might call a Christian home. That's a bit of an anachronism because the word Christian was coined later at the, uh, in Antioch. But certainly in, he grew up in a home that was faithful. His, his mother's house was the gathering place of the church in Jerusalem. He was known uh, as, a, as a boy, had known the apostles. In fact, he may, there's some evidence from his gospel that he was there in the Garden of Gethsemane when those events occurred. He was the cousin of Barnabas. As a young man, he showed great promise and great interest in the ministry. Paul and Barnabas took him along on the first missionary journey. On the first leg of the journey, they traveled across Cyprus. But then... When they reached Pamphylia on the southern coast of Asia Minor, Mark suddenly went home. No explanation for his departure is given. But later, when Barnabas wanted to take Mark on their second missionary journey, Paul refused to allow him to come. Uh, the incident is recorded in Acts 15. Paul thought Mark had shown immaturity in leaving. He reminded Barnabas that Mark had deserted them. He didn't think that Mark was ready to go again. Barnabas thought he was. He was thinking of Mark. Paul was thinking of the mission. And I think of Mark also. He wasn't ready. The two reached an impasse that became what Luke called a sharp disagreement and resulted in Paul and Barnabas parting company. Luke wrote, Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus, but Paul took Silas and left, being committed by the brethren to the grace of the Lord. Luke doesn't offer an opinion on which one of those two was right. Uh, if he gives any hint, it might be found in the fact that the church committed Paul and Silas to the grace of the Lord. Still, it's a sad chapter. Paul owed more to Barnabas than any other man. He was his entree, as it were, to the apostles. He took him under his wing. Barnabas, you know, is, means son of encouragement, and he was a great encouragement to the apostle Paul. And Barnabas left the greatest man of the church whose ministry reshaped Western history. But sad as it is, God overruled the, dis the, the disagreement for good. In, in, instead of one missionary expedition, there were two. Barnabas and Mark in Cyprus, 
Paul and Silas in Europe. And all of this turned out for Mark's good. The disappointment contributed to his development into a useful man. Paul's rebuke may have been painful, but it was needed. Proverbs 27, verse 6 states, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. A good friend wounds when necessary, just as a good physician cuts where necessary. Paul did that spiritual surgery for Mark. And Mark responded. He grew into a useful servant of the church. He wrote the gospel of Mark. He rejoined Paul in, his, in the ministry. And he was called by the apostle Paul a fellow worker in Philemon verse 24. And now here at the end of Paul's life, at a, a time of, of his greatest need, he tells Timothy, pick up Mark and bring him, for he is useful to me for service. In other words, Timothy, I really need him. Now that's a testimony to the grace of God in correcting failures. He, he builds something good out of the ashes of failure and he makes a person useful. That's sanctification. That's the grace of God. So Paul says, make every effort to come soon. Pick up Mark and bring him with you. He also wanted him to bring a few items. Verse 13, he writes, When you come, bring the cloak which I left at Troas with Carpus, and the books, especially the parchments. The identity of Carpus is unknown. He may have been the owner of the house in Troas where the church met and where Paul preached until midnight. It's recorded in Acts 20, verse 9. For some reason, Paul left his, his possessions there. Maybe he was forced to when he was suddenly arrested and taken away. And now he needs them. He needed a cloak, which suggests that conditions in jail were uncomfortable, cold, and damp. Uh, later, he adds, come before winter. He knew that it would only get worse. It adds poignancy to the passage. We, we see in Paul, we see Paul here in his last days, largely alone, without regrets, and without self-pity, he knew he was where the Lord wanted him. He knew he was on the path that the Lord had set for him. But nevertheless, he was isolated. He was cold. He was longing for companionship. And he wanted his books. One of the clear proofs that Paul was not in despair was the request that he made for his little library. His mind was still active and keenly interested in the things of God and in laboring for the Lord to the very end. There's been a lot of speculation about the identity of these documents, the, the books and parchments ranging from personal writing tools to official copies of the Lord's words. So to my mind, though, the, the best explanation is that they were copies of the Old Testament. As Paul faced death, he wanted to occupy his mind on the things that are most important. He wanted to meditate on Scripture. So he seeks to have those Scriptures with him. That's not unusual for a man of God. In fact, that's normal for a man, a woman of God. Paul placed a premium on the study and the teaching of Scripture. We see that at the beginning of, of chapter 4. Preach the Word. Be ready in season and out of season. That's, what, that's the great commission that he gives to Timothy as he's about to depart. There's nothing more important, he's saying, than preaching the Word of God. And, of course, personally, in studying the Word of God. That's what he wanted to do. A few weeks ago, I mentioned William Tyndale who was imprisoned and eventually executed for translating the Bible into English. His situation was similar to Paul's. He was confined in a cold cell 
He was alone, cut off, inactive, bored. The monotony, the, the boredom of imprisonment was a, a large part of the difficulty. And like Paul, Tyndale, who had an active mind, wrote a letter requesting a few of his things be sent to him, um, among them a warm coat and his Hebrew Bible. Christianity is not like the religions of the world, which have special cities and sacred sh shrines and buildings. Christianity has none of that. It has nothing to do with great cathedrals. I've been to some of the great cathedrals of Europe. I've entered them, I've observed them, I've admired them. They are spectacular monuments to Western civilization and the ingenuity and the skill of man, but that's not what Christianity is about. Christianity centers around a book. And what is important to the Christian is that book, the very revelation of God, the Bible, which can be carried to any city and into any building, that's what's important, the living Word of God. Paul wanted his books and parchments so that he could continue to study, that he could continue to commune with God, to continue to mature as a Christian. We mature through the Word of God. Faith comes from hearing and hearing by the Word of Christ. That's by reading the Word of God, studying it. That is how we grow. That's, that's what Paul wanted. And he would do that to the very end. There's no end to the process of maturing in the Christian life. We never come to that point in the Christian life where we've reached the level that we need to reach. And, that, and that's it. And we see the end coming and, well, it's time to just sort of relax and coast to the end. That wasn't Paul. That's not to be us. We are in a constant upward trajectory spiritually, and Paul is continuing to want to grow and to minister through the possession of the, the documents, the Word of God. Well, as I say, we never come to that point where we stop developing. Mark didn't. Mark grew and continued to grow, and Paul didn't. The things that were important to Paul were seen right here in this last portion of the book. What's important to Paul is Christian fellowship and books. When I say books, I mean the revelation of God, knowing God, knowing His Word. And he was looking forward to receiving these with Timothy's arrival, but there was a danger that might interfere with that. It was Alexander the coppersmith. Paul warns Timothy of him in verses 14 and 15. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Be on guard against him yourself, for he vigorous, vigorously opposed our teaching. Paul doesn't say how he opposed his teaching or, or what harm it was that he, he did to him. The word harm may give us a clue. It, it's related to the word informed. Maybe he was an informer at his arrest or a witness against him at his trial. Some have suggested that that's the harm that he brought. Well, maybe he was a rogue preacher or a hostile pagan. We don't know. What Paul indicates is he was dangerous. He was an opponent. He was a, a persecutor, and Timothy should be cautious if he were to meet him along the way. Now, I find that instructive in itself. There's no doubt that Timothy, as the spiritual son of Paul, as an apostolic legate, held to the theology of the Apostle Paul, that he understood the sovereignty of God, and he was committed to that. But understanding that God is absolutely sovereign over every moment of our lives doesn't mean that we don't use wisdom and caution in dealing with the events and the people of life. And that's what you see here. Be careful. That's what he was saying. He, he knew the Lord knew all of this. Paul did. And Paul was, was telling Timothy that, uh, that he would deal justly with Alexander. He says he will repay him according to his deeds. Now, now I say that, that 
is what Paul says. It wasn't getting, this wasn't a prayer. It was a statement of fact, which is to say Paul didn't brood over Alexander's hostility. He, he left all of that to the Lord. He knew the Lord will settle all these things. And he trusted the Lord who was in complete control of things. And that was the point that he was making to Timothy. He's telling him, he's giving him encouragement here so that he would, would not be fearful and would not be discouraged. He was to trust the Lord who knows all things wise. He was to be cautious and be courageous. That's what Paul is saying. The fact is, if, if we walk by faith and live openly for Christ, we will have enemies. We will have great friends, but we will have enemies. That's life in a sinful world. That's life in a fallen world. That's life in a world that is in rebellion against the Lord God. It was for Christ. It was for Paul. He spent his last days unfairly treated, shut up in a cold, dark prison, alone and bored, facing a brutal, undeserved death. But he never lost faith. He never stopped trusting in God. He knew he had a friend, a high priest, Jesus Christ, who had been there, been everywhere that the Apostle Paul had been, experienced what the Apostle Paul had experienced, and he was a sympathetic high priest. And he was praying for him. He knew that the Lord Jesus Christ was praying for him, inter interceding for him at all times. And the Lord provided for him. He brought Paul friends and the things he needed. And he will do that for you and provide everything you need, whether it's friends or books or cloaks or clothes, whatever. After all, God has provided the greatest blessing of all for us, the forgiveness of sin and life everlasting through His Son. He has given us the greatest blessing of all in Jesus Christ. And having done the greatest for us, He won't deny us the least. And everything is less than that great blessing. He will not withhold anything from us that is for our good. That's Romans 8 verse 32. Paul wrote it, Paul knew it, Paul believed it, and he lived it. That's a promise. He will provide. Trust Him. That's the great lesson for us here. Trust Him. The question is, have you received the greatest blessing? Have you, have you trusted in Christ? Do you recognize that you're a sinner? That you, that you need a Savior? If so, that Savior is Jesus Christ. He is God's eternal Son, equal with the Father in power and glory in essence, and yet became a man. Took to himself a human nature, lived a perfect life, and then offered himself up on the cross as the sacrifice for our sins. And all who believe in him, who simply trust in him, who receive him as their savior, are saved at that moment and forever. So trust in Christ and live for him and live for one another. Be a friend. Be a friend to one another. Make sacrifices for one another. In doing that, we make sacrifices for our Lord. May God help us to do that, to desire to do that and to live faithfully for Him in the short time we have in this world. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Father, we thank You for Your goodness, Your faithfulness to us. Doesn't mean we won't go through difficulties. Doesn't mean we won't go through great trials in this life. We're told that we will do that. We need to know that. That's one reason we need to gather here on Sundays to fortify ourselves spiritually. Why we need to be reading the Word of God continually and reflecting deeply on it and walking with Christ. It, as we do that, we strengthen our faith and our character and we are prepared for the trials that will certainly come at some point. 
that you're faithful to us to provide for all of our needs and all of the difficulties of life. And one of the great blessings you give us is a friend, good friends. We have them in abundance in Christ. Lord, may we be good friends to one another. Make us that to your glory. We thank you for Christ who sacrificed himself for us, and it's in his name we pray. Amen.